Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes, I just want to say again how honored we are that you would come to give a month to your mind to anchor in a purpose that is a, a blessing for the whole world, for the whole universe. Because it's no small thing in a world where everything is ego-driven and ego-based. Control, possession, competition, striving. It's no small thing to take a pause and say, there's another way. There's a way that my mind can be used that will help, that will bring relief, that will bring release, that will bring escape for everyone. Instead, instead of thinking of things in terms of what will bring individual gain, individual survival, even individual contribution. It's like being willing to open up and say, hmm, I have, a, I have a gift to offer to everyone and to myself. And it's the experience of, of true, true freedom. And so as we start off here on a, a Monday morning, um, We've come through the orientation of the weekend of, how did I get here? <laughs> Some of you maybe are even less clear about, how did I get here? I'm here, but <laughs> I don't know how I got here. <laughs> how did I beam in <laughs> into this? And, and what is the prayer of my heart? And then, as we do sometimes on Jason's show, from the bottom up, it's like starting to go from that prayer of the heart what is really the prayer of my heart, to look at what, what specifics are arising, what, what fears or doubts or blocks or issues are more at the surface of my consciousness. And that we can work with. You know, it's not like we just click our heels or wiggle our nose and, and experience enlightenment. It's, it's actually letting the darkness arise and giving the spaciousness, the allowance, the invitation to say, I'm okay, I know I've had some darkness there, but I'm not going to push it down, I'm not going to push it away, I'm not going to try to pretend it's not there. I, I am with my mighty companions, I am with the presence of love, I can handle whatever needs to move through, just like passing clouds. I can let the clouds move through and I know the sunshine is there and I know the light is there. And so the three of us are just here too to be very open at, um, at trying to join with you so when these doubts or fears or issues come up that we can, we can join in a context where you can feel the safety, like this is a safe container, a safe womb, a, a safe space for those issues to emerge. And I think that's part of the prayer of your heart, is you want the safety feeling, you want that feeling of safety when you're going to be looking at whatever is in your mind. There's a subsection of A Course in Miracles that's titled The Fear to Look Within. As human beings, we're so taught to deal with things, to react and respond to the images, to survive, to make our way in the world. It's like a, a survival struggle, both physically and psychologically. And there's a lot of energy. Most of our energy is put in that direction because that's what a fully functioning human being is supposed to be, someone who can handle 
the issues and the struggles that that come at you seemingly are acted out on a daily basis. And if you can just start to get that feeling of safety, like, oh, I'm safe and I can do this and I can handle this and start to build a confidence with the Spirit that the Spirit is helping me step by step through everything that's happening. Every thing that is arising is not by accident. It needs to arise. It needs to be allowed to arise. It's not a problem that it's arising. And that's a big turn, because our programming is saying problems are problems, and problems must be dealt with, and dealt with quickly, because there's too many more problems that will come too. And many of us have felt like we've been plugging the holes of a dam, and it's very exhausting in this human experience to keep plugging plugging the dam and have more water squirting out in other places. More pebbles, more rocks, more squirting out in other places. And that's why people can get so frustrated with that whole thing that that's where suicide even comes in as an option. And the ego is a death wish, so of course it's going to use that as one of its wild cards. Just kill yourself. Because it's so frustrating. The human condition is so depressing when you try to deal with it from a personal basis. It's almost like it's endless seeming issues. More arise and more. Just when you think you've simplified your life and you're getting on top of things, then it starts hitting you from other angles, torpedoed from other angles. And that's why people will even succumb to this idea of, of suicide or killing themselves for the desire to have some relief, when actually that's still the death wish under there. And Jesus tells us in the Course, the ego will pursue you beyond the grave, lest anybody <laughs> think the suicide is an answer. That Those kind of lines from Jesus is like, okay, thank you for giving it to me straight. <laughs> the ego will pursue me beyond the grave. It's It's like that's why we're here now. That's why we're joining together to handle this darkness and fear, because there is no future escape. It's just allowing and facing things, and then also allowing our trust in, a, in another direction to grow stronger. So for all of us, that's part of the context of us welcoming you today, is that, that we heard this inner calling, we heard this inner voice, we made a decision to move in the direction of that inner voice, even though, you know, there's not a lot in history that that is there to reinforce following the inner voice. Most of history is is evidence against that there is an inner voice. Atheism is rampant. Uh, you know, there are many people that don't believe in God, and, and we learn from the Course, uh, belief in God is unnecessary. <laughs> For God can be but known. It doesn't matter whether you're a believer or an atheist. Until you forgive, you still have the same issue, the same thorn, in the same fear, the same doubt. There's nothing better, actually, about being a believer or an atheist. In the end, until you can zoom into the core of forgiveness. And so our lives have been... Um, I was called very strongly, like Mother Teresa felt her calling, different ones, I felt a very strong call and it, it came to me very quickly that that I would go and answer the call without hesitation and would just fully give my faith to the call and that was a very important decision for me. I think it was, it was probably some point after I'd come across the course in 1986, some and after maybe a, about a year or two, I just felt the calling so strong that there was a big yes. Like, yes, I give you everything. Yes, I will serve in any way. Yes, I, I, I don't have to have a future. You give me my directions. I will follow. That happened in there in the early years of working with the Course. And then, um, and then meeting... Jason at a, 
a church, I think it was a religious science church, and there's something sparked there for Jason. He felt the calling, and then meeting Michael down in Australia, and and both of them had been on the spiritual journey uh, quite a bit already, but there was something that just clicked and sparked where they felt like, yes, this is it, I feel it. And somewhere there, there was a big yes of this is what I'm going for and this is my direction. And it is kind of a quality of forsaking all else in the world because it's, it's like you can start to see that whatever you were pursuing, whatever you were going after in, in the world was not satisfying. So there's usually some kind of disillusionment that comes before that yes. Like, oh, I've tried it. I've tried it on my own. It's been a struggle. It's been kind of sad or depressing or frustrating or um, just outright crazy. And then we come to that, like down on our knees, oh, there has to be a better way, which is Bill Thedford's prayer to Helen, sharing it with Helen Shuckman, there has to be a better way. And he was quite surprised that she answered, yes, Bill, and I'll, I'll help you find it. So there was a joining there in opening to another way between seemingly those two people and that even allowed A Course in Miracles to come through as an answer to that prayer for there has to be a better way. So as we start off this uh, mystery school of, us, of these different sessions, um, all of us have have kind of gone through the keyhole of of hearing that inner call, answering that inner call. And in the Bible, there is some words about the chosen ones, which sometimes people think that refers to the Jews of the time or whatever. Jesus reinterprets uh, the chosen ones into all are called. Few choose to listen. So you can see that universal quality is, again, taking it above the personal, the chosen ones, to all, all are called to awaken from this dream, and few choose to listen. And we could say from a perspective that they're just not ready. It's, it's all about readiness. That's what really drew all of us together in this quantum way to all be here, is somewhere, some quality deep inside has said that we're ready for this. We wouldn't be here to go through this experience unless we were ready. And and it's still going to take willingness, but there has to be like almost like a baseline of readiness throughout for, for all of us to come together in this way. So there's a baseline quality of readiness and now it's going to take willingness and there will be decision points along the way as we go deeper in coming into full acceptance of this calling, this inner calling. And Jesus was, you know, known for, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world and also I am calling you out of the world. He's really saying I'm calling you out of ego thinking. That's all it really means. It doesn't mean that it's prescribing that you'll, you know, live in a cave or become a monk or a nun or some kind of form function. It's actually just calling you out of ego thinking, calling you out of the imposter self to the real self, to the, the higher self. So we felt like this morning we would open it up. This could be uh, more of a question and answer session based on the thoughts and the things that are coming up into your consciousness here. And um, that's just a little preamble by me. I don't know if either of you have something to add to that. Or we, I know I see the purple microphone is, <laughs> Nicholas has it in hand. And yeah, that's where we start. We start together by just taking what's arising in awareness this morning. So if you want to... Hand Willow the the purple microphone will pass around. Thank you. Whew, 
the yes feels really big in my heart. And I feel expanded. <clears throat> and what floated up into my awareness this morning was the 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 belief in in bodies and this physical desire to be held by another body and it doesn't feel like a problem it's more just a i don't know a curiosity because it feels like i don't i don't understand what that means anymore like my desire for god is so consuming it's like I journal and I feel like I'm writing and there's like this love letter to God, this this exchange of just pouring my heart out and then just receiving this love. And yet there's this question of like, well, what about these images that I'm seeing? What and this desire that I feel? Do I what do I do with that? Do I just keep giving it over to to God and I mean, I say yes, keep giving it over to God <laughs> and, and just ask for that sensation to be fulfilled through Him. Yeah, I can feel that. I, there is a part of the Course where Jesus says, do not raise body thoughts to the level of mind. And what that means is, is, once you raise body thoughts to the level of mind, which the level of mind is causation. We, we know from metaphysical studies that the world of images isn't causative. It's the mind where the causation is. Ultimately, if you take it all the way back to God, the mind of God is the first cause. And Christ is the, the effect, the extension of that first cause. And that's why all of heaven is really contained in that cause-effect relationship where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. But, but do not raise body thoughts to the level of mind is really meaning don't give causation to the body and to the world of form because you cannot escape guilt if you give causation to form. Form is, a, is an unreal effect of an unreal cause. The ego made up all the form. It's a projection. But what Jesus says is, when you raise body thoughts to the level of mind, you you take like a, a responsibility or an ownership for those thoughts, and that's where the guilt comes in. Responsibility for children and parents, responsibility even for the body, the health of the body, the well-being of the body. Um, it's one of those things that's so deeply ingrained that you you have to become go from being a child body to being a fully functioning, responsible adult body. And then when you reach that, you find out you still have guilt <laughs> and nothing really has changed. You were guilty, you felt guilty at times as a child and you feel guilty as an adult. So this is where Jesus says, uh, give them to me. Let all your thoughts, these thoughts, be given to me and put under my control because that's the only way that you will experience yourself as guilt-free. That's the only way you'll experience the love in a full way is, is by not trying to take personal responsibility for those thoughts. That's part of that hand them over to me. And then, and then Jesus knows that for a mind that's been very identified with time and space and form and bodies, that there's going to be a transition period. So the bodies, will say, and the images given over to Jesus, is going to mean there are going to be symbols. So I can relate to that. I remember on the spiritual journey, to me it was a very solitary journey uh, for many, many, many years. And I think I pr had that prayer request that you're <laughs> waking up day after day. I would like to be held. I would like to be held. If it's not too big of a deal, <laughs> and, and it seemed to go unanswered for many years. Uh, uh, so it's like, well, I give you my life, you know, so I'm really... 
<laughs> you know, you're the one in charge, you know what's best. But that seemed to be when that finally came along, it was very powerful because it was a very strong symbol to me of feeling loved, of feeling embraced, to to be held. Uh, I oftentimes would think, wow, I think I could have done this much faster and quicker <laughs> if only I was held, <laughs> you know, during, it would have gone, the tears would have gone through and the, the dark clouds would have passed through faster. But obviously, if everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I've asked, there must have been some fear or doubt or something, uh, some belief that was was keeping me from experiencing that because the world is like a motion picture of our beliefs. But I do find that with our community and with the awakening is it's it's like a celestial speed up, it's going much faster, that some of the things that I seem to go through to take years, they seem to come faster and faster and I can just see it all around me. Just as when I said I use me and I, I traveled around the world and and one of the greatest experiences for me of traveling around the world and sharing these ideas was meeting people and I, I got hundreds and thousands of hugs. So in, I got mine in little mini bites. Instead of just laying there for a few hours and crying and being held, I got little mini bite hugs <laughs> from thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> Jesus is like, see, I answered it. Just There was smaller little mini holds. <laughs> Uh, that that worked very, very well. That was very important for me, too, because I could feel like this bursting love in my heart, and then the, the hugs and the embraces felt like a natural outpicturing and expression of that. And so I think that's something that we can talk about, too, for, for mystery school. I mean, there are a lot of different times where we've had... Uh, somebody holding somebody or or even what do we call it healing A's healing and touch A's and B's healing touch um, that's also a call for for sessions like that where a lot of times people have not had that experience of being held and it feels like it would be so helpful intuitively and sometimes those healing touch sessions are being held or touched in, in a way that feels very nurturing and supportive. Um, also, when I've traveled, I would do these things called angel baths that some of you have experienced where that was like a tunnel of people lined up and you would go through one at a time and people would just touch and, and whisper kind words and thoughts and just going through that tunnel of love called an angel bath, people had huge heart openings tears would come, they would have their eyes closed, and they would just go through this experience of this outpouring of love that they had never experienced as they walked through this sometimes quite long tunnel, uh, very slowly, with their hands out, eyes closed and hands out, and just being led like by a, like a choir of angels through. That was something we would do. We did a number of experiential things that, that were very helpful and um, they were very just guided by the spirit you know we we would say okay I'm hearing this and we would sometimes set it up that you're almost to heaven and you've just got to go through one more tunnel of angels before you arrive in heaven so close your eyes and hold out your hands and let yourself be carried through this final passage and and even though that involved bodies but it was the spirits guided exercises to help allow the mind to open up and receive the love in a way that was still practical to that mind, still relevant. And um, I remember one time I was in North Carolina and we did this long, long angel bath and it was so long that it w wound around inside this church and then it went right to the doors and then we had to open the doors and there was this brilliant sunlight out Side. So they put me out in the parking lot and the people would go through this long bath and then they'd come out and I'd give them a big hug. As Even with their eyes closed, everything was so bright because <laughs> they were walking out into the sunlight. And again, the Spirit just orchestrated that as a symbol 
for people to feel that that love. And then I gave them a big embrace, and and I was having holy encounters out in the parking lot because this was at the very end of the retreat, and some man came to pick up his wife and says, "What's going on? And where is she?" I said. We're in heaven out here in the parking lot, and and so just bear with me. She's going to make it through there, and then I'll give her a big hug, and then you can take her home. <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, cool, you know." But he was just showing up, and you just have the joyful, holy encounters with with everyone because you're in just the joy of you know that it's all just symbols that are being used that help the mind make that transition from a very concrete, specific world into a very abstract state of mind of love and light. So just you bring, putting it out, is that's, that's really the best thing to do, is to say, I really would, this would be really helpful. I would love to just be held. And, and then whether it comes out into a, an A's and B's or a healing touch or or a one-on-one -on -one where you feel it's you don't have a lot of words to say, but I'd rather rather be held. I've done so many one-on-ones over the years that sometimes people, when they come into the one-on-one, -on -one, they they know exactly what they want. They'll say, "I have no questions. I have no issues. I would just want to eye gaze with you for half an hour." Is that okay? I say, okay, let's. let's say. But sometimes they come through the door and they know exactly <laughs> what they want or what would be helpful and so they just speak it and then that's that's the way you know for all of us that helps us to help that be answered and you shouldn't think of it in terms of like a, a need because again all you're doing is it's the prayer of your heart to the spirit just saying please use me guide me in ways that I will feel that everything is involuntary like there's no individual chooser that's saying god i need this or i need that let let everything be used in such a, a spirit given way that that everything starts to feel involuntary that you don't feel like you have personal control over your body or the world and that loosening from that personal control and that personal possession is part of the awakening because as you go deeper into the dreamer, dreamer of the dream state of mind, you start to realize that you're just beholding everything without any sense of personal responsibility for anything. That's where the guilt came in of thinking, trying to take personal responsibility. So thank you, Willow. That's, that's a very practical question and prayer to start off with for all of us. Yeah. And there's a couple, one there and there. Um, the physical body still is such a block for me. And you know, I've read the course just for a year and a half, but and then I kind of say, well, it's not real. It's not real. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. But it still aches and it still hurts. And, well, that's fear. Okay, well, yeah, you know, the mind just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> trying to figure it out, trying to. And my focus tends to be so much on the body and the ouches and the pains and the whatevers that I'm not fully present. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very common where there's such a, a an identification and in such a um it seems to be too from the human experience that seems to be a very realistic experience and yet you could just say whenever there's the aches and pains and everything that those are forms of upset um in awareness. And then that's where as we practice those workbook lessons, I'm never upset for the reason I think we're getting these really deep set of teachings from Jesus and metaphysics to practice little by little, day by day, moment by moment, bit by bit, at reversing our thoughts from from the focus on the world to going inside. Traditionally, some have have done it through prayer, some have done it through meditation, some have done it through like philosophical contemplation 
uh, or like someone from the famous saint from the East, Ramana Maharshi, who is the I, you know, asking that question repeatedly with many, many things. Who is the I? Who is the I? So there are different means and methods for that. But um, what we'd like to do is um, is start to get you into a, a, having a practical methodology and process for dealing with those feelings that you're feeling around the body and those and the thoughts that are in your mind. And um, years ago I got this from the Spirit, this thing called Instrument for Peace. These um, It was like a worksheet, like Byron Katie has worksheets. I, I got a 12-step uh, worksheet. And so many people in our community have practiced and practiced and practiced with that worksheet and then um, as a way of, like Byron Katie would say, turning it around. This is the same thing that the, that worksheet is for, is starting out with specifically what you're feeling, aches, pains, struggles, difficulties around the body. That could be a good starting point at the beginning and then working through it. And then, uh, and then it became an inspiration uh, for... Uh, one of the people in our community, Laverne, to put it into an interactive um, online robot <laughs> so that basically when you contact this robot called Spiri, instead of Siri, which is the on the iPhones, the Spir- when you make this contact with Spiri, Spiri will say, how are you feeling? You can say, well, I'm hurting and I've got a pain here today and I woke up with this pain and this part of my body and everything. And then Spiri would would take that 12-step kind of um, worksheet and put it into an interactive where you, you're texting how your experiences and Spiri's taking you step by step as if you have a, a counselor at the other end. Maybe Jason can talk a little bit about that because that's that part is actually, we're working on having that um, put into a, an app on a phone so you could just (laughs) hit the app on your phone and start to go through this but actually um, it's a way that people in our community actually will say oh I had this coming up for me I did a Spiri Spiri session I don't know how many people in the room have have experienced that There's, there's quite a few that have done that so so that's part of this turning around and retraining. And J- Jason always has exciting news of of how Spiri is advancing and developing. Well, we've been waiting for a platform to emerge that would allow us to expand even upon the instrument for peace. And just before I came up here two days ago, Google created this Google Cloud and Amazon created something called Amazon Sage, where they have machine learning and AI development. So we plan on expanding it for things like body aches and then what do you do if you have body aches is it time for some kind of interdiscipline or a diet or a relationship and really to help you go deeper and deeper but it's like for the first time listening to you talk about Spiri I've always thought this instrument for peace was a very minimalistic use of the potential but I was just like wow that is really cool (laughs) for the first time my my own invention I like or or Laverne's or whatever but it's it's interesting too because there's two ways of looking at these bots. Like sometimes people think, well, I'd like someone human. And then sometimes it's people that prefer the other. They want a bot because they don't feel they're going to be judged, right? But but we get a, people go through this and they pour their hearts out into these things. And then we're getting a high blockage rate because people think that if they block the bot, no one will ever know their thoughts that were <laughs> typed out in this thing. So they write it all out and they're like delete 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 so it's it's the underlying shame that really needs to be healed that you believe these thoughts are yours so that's why there's like there can be a repetitive nature with doing spiri over and over or having a counseling session over and over and over until finally like you you probably didn't watch it but yesterday andy one of our volunteers i call him millennials down in uh yeah nicholas was there he did his show and he came to me right before the show and he was so nervous because he was like, 
I'm blocked. I can't connect with Nicholas. I don't know what to do. I've had that experience many times with David. And just to be on the observer, I'm like, well, what, what is it really? And there was something coming up into his awareness that he was so ashamed of that he just like just blocked his mighty companion out of view. And I was like, my only job was to like say, no, it's okay if you have to say that. Forget about the show. It doesn't matter if you lose your show because it's so bad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so he's like, okay, I'll just see if it comes in. And then I could feel it coming. I was at the back of the show and I, I went into the support him and I pulled my chair right up to the front. And then he looks over at me right on live TV and he's like, is it okay? I'm like, it's okay. You know, and he, he talks about his, it was masturbation thoughts and he just, he said it and you could just feel the energy. Like the whole world was waiting for him and. Finally, when he let it go, you know, he was shaking and the show ended and he just looked over at Nicholas and he's like, well, though, there goes my self-concept as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> it was all for that, to let go of the self-concept. And, and you know, David's given us such permission. To, we're not here to be famous. We're not here to become teachers. We're here to undo the world and whatever it takes, it takes. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, uh, with me, I have this sort of recurrent, I suppose everybody does, but um, lack of self-worth. Um, I would happily go and live in a cave, which I'm actually doing here <laughs> but when I'm at home. Um, social phobia. I, but I listen to myself when I'm talking and my mind is screaming, you're talking shit, stop talking. And the more it goes on, the, you know, the worse it becomes or whatever. I just, I have, it's always kind of been with me. And I, an example, last year flew over here because your teachings I find so inspirational and whatever. And that, Jeffrey and Susanna's wedding the tables were set out and there's nobody sitting opposite me and then I see you heading across the green to sit opposite me and I was like oh my god this is a great honor nope and I scarpered <laughs> I just got, I was like oh my god I've come here to be in this man's presence to listen to him and what do I do I legged it because I just this the lack of self worth. What do you talk to an ascended master about? He doesn't do small talk. Neither do I. Oh my god! Everything was just a big jumble in my head, you know. And um, but it's it's social gatherings or whatever. You know, I, I hate them. I avoid them like the plague. I don't go. I just it's this. And I do your five, six, seven, eight. Uh, you know. Um, and I know when I meet people, it's you know in a social gathering or whatever. It's I know I'm. It's the past I'm reliving, this constant feeling of lack of self-worth. You're stupid. You don't have anything interesting to say. And on and on and on, the ego goes. So, And also, the hugging thing, I can do little mini hugs after that. It's like, no, that's no, I can't do long huggings at all. So again, I suppose that's part of the lack of self-worth. So I just thought I felt to share that. Yeah, it's. I think it's beautiful that you can just share that and expose that and disclose that because, because as with many, you know, that's that's almost the definition of coming to this world is some kind of uh, self low low self worth or belief in uh, incompleteness and lack. And um, I can certainly relate to it when I look back to the parable of David because that's that's really how I felt. As a child, I, I felt a strong sense of um, not being worthy, and I I really seemed to people my world that way. Where I I started as as I came through childhood and out of childhood into a, very much of a self concept of being a loner, uh, of always being on the outside of society, outside of school, outside of classmates, not having uh, close friends, um, and 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 then even when I would have start to have one or two or three close friends, it would be that would be a very tight little circle. It wouldn't extend to other classmates or to the world at all. It's it's kind of like feeling me against the world, and so and I know that that self concept and that 
lack of worthiness was so strong that actually it seemed to go all the way through childhood, all the way through adolescence, and and really into the 20s, because um, even when I was off to university, I was still much, very much a loner, not having relationships, uh, having very small, small, tiny little circles that I would interact with, and uh, being quite afraid of of anything more, you know, just being there. And so in high school, I was voted most shy, shy, most quiet in my senior class. And then in university, people would almost make fun of me when I would be on group projects, you know, as if I was kind of an outcast from another planet and who didn't um, speak much or interact and so on and so forth. And then all the way, not, I don't think I went on my first date till I was 27. So there was a, it was a very much, a very strong self-concept of shyness and avoidance that was basically based on that unworthiness I could see now. And so to me that, that bodes well for what the Course is teaching because when I was about 27, 20, 28 years old when the Course first came into my life, I, I think I was ready, almost like I was. I had enough of that. I, I knew I wanted to break out from that and go beyond that, but I didn't know how. And then the Course was almost like the strong medicine that Jesus was saying, "Oh yeah, I, no problem. You know, I can handle. I can handle that kind of self concept." Um, Oh, I handled Moses. Moses stuttered, and and all you know, all the spirit can handle any thing for whatever is needed to open up. And and it was through practicing really the course, not just studying it, but really starting to take it to heart. When I would go to course groups and I would get little prompts sometimes to say something, I had to acknowledge that, even though that was very out of pattern for me to speak at course groups at the beginning. You know, it was and even the prompting to go to those groups and then the second group, and then the third, fourth, the fifth. At one point I was going to five course groups, and that was out of the box for me. And that was just the beginnings. So it's, it is a seemingly a process, and it's seemingly a journey inward, but um, just your step of coming here last year and then coming back again, and you know, also looking around at the the places where you could stay, picking something that you felt comfortable with. You know, it's almost like, okay, here's my comfort zone where I am right now. I'm here to get expanded beyond the familiar, beyond my ego's comfort zone, which really ultimately is not comfort at all, but but we do have to take it step by step. And then, um, and then to give yourself over to... I, I would call it an adventure. I had to put the spiritual journey in my mind into some kind of uh, category. So I would say it's an adventure. Oh, I, that's good. It sounds good. For a quiet, shy guy, I think I need some adventure. So I'm on an adventure with Jesus. So, okay, here we go. What's going to happen? What's going to open it up? And And slowly coming into purpose, which we'll talk a lot about, your function and your purpose, is the thing that will lift you higher and higher out of that sense of unworthiness into a sense of true fulfillment, not fulfillment of achieving, accumulating, collecting, you know, the things that the world would say you can you can overcome the sense of lack and unworthiness by becoming somebody important, somebody important in the world to counteract low self-esteem with good self-esteem which is tied into a lot of the self-help things, you know, how to build your self-esteem and how to, how to become a winner. You know, you look at all the books and everything. When I was going into the Course, Jesus wasn't really taking me onto a path of trying to develop a good self-esteem. It was that my entire investment in ego thinking was part of a false esteem, that that's what the, the depth of the unworthiness was about, and I needed a function to fulfill that would truly lift me higher into consciousness and higher into higher states of mind that were rooted in truth, not in uh, the world. So I feel like you coming here um, 
we all have had our our stories of what we did in the world and how we were undone. Uh, um, maybe that's a good place for you, Michael, to talk about. Because Michael was on the spiritual journey and then just coming across the Course and my teachings was was like it started to propel you. Uh, but whereas I don't think I ever reached anything in the world where the world would say that I was successful. I mean, a lot of people, they go through this whole thing and they work so hard to become successful, then they've got to dismantle the whole thing. I don't think I ever reached a point where I thought, I'm a success. Certainly my parents would never say, David, you are a success. It was more me pouring my heart out to my mother one day saying, oh, I failed at this and I failed at this and I failed and... and, and and, but I'm really, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to make a change in my life. And she said, no, it's too late. <laughs> so uh, I was just like, oh. <laughs> but, but I never really, I don't think I ever really developed what, what the world would call successful self-concept. So I never really had to unwind and peel that away. But I did feel feel the the shyness and the unworthiness and maybe michael you can talk about about how you how you were because you were married and children and and were running a company you know it was more of that kind of i would say the world would say you were pretty successful so it's how do you go from being a success in an illusory world <laughs> to humbly be taken back down, you know, to a place where you feel like you were saying today, I am no, it's Labor Day in the United States, and he's, Michael's laughing over there going, and I am under no laws but God's. It's Labor Day, but I am under no laws but God's. I was thinking God. it's the first day of our projects. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be seemingly laboring, but uh, we're laboring for the Lord. So. Yeah, laboring for the Lord. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> It's interesting because it, I always like to start off, I think, that I'm – this is highly individualized. So this is a really helpful thing because it's different for everybody. So this is what happened for me and this is what I needed to go through. I'm pretty stubborn, I think, you know, so I – because at 22 I had a quite an epiphany, I guess, where uh, I really felt I had this yeah, huge epiphany one night. Um, and it was this thing about I'm going to be very successful – and I'm going to be incredibly spiritual. It was like two. I could see two things. And uh, <clears throat> and my, my financial side will actually fund an amazing spiritual sort of centres around the world. And, and I see a lot of people who aren't uh, – I've got a lot of friends who are spiritual, but they don't, you know, don't have any money and they don't know – and they seem to struggle. So I'm going to look after them. So here are the dream kicked in at that point and it was seen very honourable and all. And so then the next 20 years was very much building business, businesses and um, seemingly very successful in the world, money, houses, cars, uh, influential friends, you name it, it was all that. And but always had the spiritual side that was always developing and, and so all sorts of personal development. You know, I was big on the personal development thing, especially in the 80s. It seemed to be huge at that point. And um, I was just uh, just going for it, you know. And the mantras, I'd be right into the mantras and really becoming successful and all that sort of thing. How am I feeling? And I'd, I'd see I'd actually be bullshitting myself a lot too, you know. How are you going? You have to ask yourself, how are you going? Oh, I'm good. I'm fantastic. You know, I'm going for it. <laughs> so it was like a, this big cover over I was doing actually for a long time, for decades, literally for 20 years. Like I say, slow, slow learner. So it's never too late. Uh, and then I had the course uh, in the early 90s, came across the course, opened it up, said, wow, that's absolutely amazing. I can't wait to study this sometime, you know. <laughs> and then over the next 10 years, I'd do the same thing. Wow, this is amazing, but I'm just not ready for it yet. I'm too busy partying. I'm too busy, you know, making it and going for it. The whole time there was all the time through that whole 20 years, there was like this but in my mind. You know, I'm going along. I was really never that happy in the business I was in. Just it happened to fall on my lap actually when I was 20. It was amazing. All this epiphany stuff that happened suddenly, this business with all these contracts landed in my lap. So I just went for it. I said, I'm going to do this until I find something that I really want to do. Well, 
20 years. Uh, I was doing it very successful. It was all going very well. So why, why would you change it? You know, we'd just keep doing it. I'll plot along. And the spiritual stuff was always there. And so the course was there. And I was opening this thing up and going, wow, this is amazing. Too busy partying. And eventually in 2004 is when I really got serious. I said, I'm going to study this book. It was the beginning of the year and away I went. And that was life-changing. I was on these, I was getting sponsored on these amazing cruises around the world and, you know, our suppliers would put all these fancy things on. And I remember being in the Mediterranean on this amazing boat, sitting there, and it was only four months into the course, I think I just said, what what am I doing here? What is this? Why am I doing this? You know, it was like this incredible emptiness when I was in what seemed like one of the most fantastic things you could be doing, you know. There was an incredible emptiness that scared me in a way. Part of it scared me and part of it excited me. It was really weird because I could feel there was something going on. There was something deep happening to me and I thought, whoa, this is this is deep, this course thing, you know. And I can't say I fully understood it when I first got into it, but there was something deep down that just knew this is right, you know, and I kept going for it. So... <clears throat> the next five years I studied it myself between 2004, 2009. And then uh, – and I was just so busy. I always thought about having a – going into a course group or something but, you know, just never got around to it. It's too, too much going on. One time I was completely laid out in 2009 where I just couldn't even get off the bed. I just – I was laid out. I always went to work. didn't matter how sick I was. This time I couldn't. And I thought, well, I might just check out about a course group. So I found a course group. It was only 15 minutes from my place. I lived in Sydney. Um, and I thought, this is cool. So I went, after I got a bit well, uh, to this course group and opened up this door. This little Chinese lady opened the door, happened to be Frances Zhu, right? so, <laughs> which is pretty poetic. <laughs> she lived just 15 minutes away from my house and had this course group going. And um, there was, uh, as soon as I entered, I put my hand out to shake one of these guys. And this big guy sort of come over and hugged me, Les Sherado. He's a Qantas pilot. And um, he said, come along, you know. And so that was an amazing experience actually, finding other people who are interested in this stuff, going, wow, this is amazing. And then they gave me some CDs and, and a DVD of a David Hoff summit or another. <laughs> and uh, I plugged into my car and I was just blown away and that was never, I never took them out then. You know, I just, I just loved it. I soaked it up. At the end of um, later that year, there was a retreat, just for a two-day retreat in a place called Kangaroo Valley, a couple of hours out of where I lived. And a couple of messengers came out. It was actually Jason and Kirsten, actually. And um, that was it. I just knew I had to do that. It was just like, uh, I have to do that. I didn't know what that meant. I had no idea, but it was like this overwhelming feeling, I have to do that. Married 19 years, two kids, business, you know, all that, all that was happening right there. And then... And... It seemed fairly rapid. Within a few weeks, I was separated from my wife, and um, you know, you you went home, and after that, and you said to your wife, "I need a a mighty companion. I need a mind training partner. Is what I need. Yeah, for the marriage. Yeah, this is what I. It was like a shift of purpose. Yeah, it's like oh, going right to your wife and saying it straight out, Mm. and she was probably like." What's a mighty companion and what's a mind training partner? <laughs> Michael, what has happened? So, so I described all that too and she yeah. said, yeah, I'm going to be that for you. Okay, great. Let's do it. So we tried that for a couple of weeks but it really didn't. A couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't happening. It was sort of me dragging, you know, and that was my classic thing. That's what I was doing for 20 years, dragging people along with me, hero of the dream, you know, just I've got to look after you. have got to fix it, Mr. Fix it, you know. And whatever my way to spirituality, I was, I was always dragging, you know, thr- shoving it down people's throats, you know. I had some money too, so I'd buy boxes of books of whatever the latest book is, hand them out. Here, you've got to read this, you know, checking on them. Have you been reading the book? You know, <laughs> it's just unbelievable. I must have been a nightmare. Work with the wife. Every no, no, two no. Weeks, she's like, mm. <laughs> So then we separated and I thought, I'm going home to God by myself, you know. This is it. I don't need another relationship. I don't need anything. Don't even need money, you know, that's what I had in my mind. I soon saw that that was all guilt, right? The spirits got use of the funds. And uh, within a few weeks then after that, another 
seemingly female came in, you know, a mighty companion. <laughs> seemingly female. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's what it seems like now. Did you, just, did you ever felt the mighty companion thing still very strong? Yeah, yeah, that, that was it. And it seemed, and I thought it was very odd at the time and yet I couldn't help but feel the connection, you know, there was a connection there. And it's like you can't, you know, how far do we go with these things? Well, it was, I'm, into meta, I'm just going to get onto the metaphysical ghosting. But it, was, it was cool because I was living with them at the whole time this was going on. And so I could feel him and Mel being paired up, but the, the ex-wife was not happy hearing about this. So Michael went from a mansion, $2 million house probably, cars and businesses, to living out of a car. With Mel. A small car. A very small. A hatchback. <laughs> Honda Civic. A Honda Civic hatchback. <laughs> From a mansion to a Honda Civic hatchback. I remember that. Remember, this is highly individualized. It's yes. not necessarily for you. I just want yeah. to say that. I it had was... a lot of unwinding to do. This was pretty thick up here, you know. I remember that car. It was packed. I would go, mm, you've got everything in there. I was like looking around the back. <laughs> Mystic's delight, you know. Wow. <laughs> Instead of a camper. <laughs> That's exactly what we call it, the Mystic's Delight, yeah. <laughs> little, little green Civic. Okay. Yeah, so the, um, I could see wanting to go home to God by myself. It was, was really a, like a metaphysical ghosting thing. We might, we'll probably get into that term a bit more, but using the metaphysics, slapping it on top, thinking I'm further advanced than what I am, uh, not needing anyone else, you know, all that sort of thing, whereas really I don't know my own best interests, you know, to... I had to swallow a big humble pill to be able to say, okay, there's this one that's given I seem to have a vibrational connection with and that's, once again it's great having mighty companions that we could all feel it. And so this one was given which was really helpful for help me unwinding from um, very, very deeply wound into the world, you know. And so then the unwinding was happening and it was rocky. <laughs> there was a lot went on. And was very rocky with my extended family, you know, I come from a European family. I'm the oldest son of five, you know, it was just like a Maltese family. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we go into the Maltese Inquisition, yeah. but there was a Maltese Inquisition. <laughs> Jason was <laughs> this, My family and friends all came along just to absolutely tear apart what the heck was going on. What's happened to Michael? He's gone, he's gone haywire. I don't know if you want it's to a say nice gathering where you got to a nice the, gathering. <laughs> well, it's a great opportunity when you you're showing up to let Jesus, the Holy Spirit, speak through you, and and the missiles are coming, uh, and which is when you need Jesus and the Holy Spirit uh, to to bring the presence of love. So yeah, that was quite an interesting. That's my favorite story of all my because <laughs> I was traveling around with Mel at the time while they were getting paired, and we were going to do this gathering in Sydney. We actually went out for dinner with our hosts and we had just ordered and I was like, I felt so nervous or something wasn't right. I said to Mel, we need to go home. We didn't know why. So we canceled our order with our hosts, which is very unlikely. Went back to the house and just meditated together. And then we walked out of the room and found out why we had to be so joined. In walks Michael to this big gathering at the house. And then Michael's brother, his boss, his cousin, his wife still legally married everybody basically that cared about you walked into this room michael sat at the very back of the room and he could just watch him he's like (laughs) 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 please god help me first question so jason do you ask everybody to leave their kids and uh (laughs) that's the first question (laughs) shoot But the Holy Spirit handled it so beautifully because I had been living with this guy, Frank, who had five young kids for months. And I was in prayer with that question, you know, and Frank was the, he's like, I can attest that I've been living with Jason for a few months. He never told me to leave my kids. You know? it, was just like, it was like the perfect response, but it went into the highly individualized nature of, of the awakening. And actually by the end of the gathering, the Helen, Helena. She came up and we had a one-on-one and beautiful encounter. She even bought a book and, and took it home. So, I mean, in terms of best use of time, it was really well used. So, yeah. And that's, that's a good example of how in every single situation, it's always just a prayer to let the Spirit come through us and extend love. 
regardless of what seems to be happening. I mean, if if you perceive anything through the ego filter, you're going to perceive an attack. And then then the defensiveness comes up and the justifying and the reasons and all the other things. Almost like you have to defend something and yet when you really come into alignment with spirit, you feel so innocent, so in the moment, so clueless that you become like a conduit for the presence of love to come and always offer a blessing. Always offer a blessing. So in countless seeming gatherings, like this could be considered a gathering, but in countless opportunities, you still have that opportunity to pray and to remember why you're truly there, to, to offer healing, to, to heal and to be healed uh, by letting the Spirit come through you. And, and that's what was talked about earlier, about uh, learning to let go of the personality self and let go of the identification, in your case, with, with feeling unworthy. Teach classes, they're irrelevant what they are, but I actually use them as a platform to introduce the Course in Miracles and, and I feel totally at home and I, I, it, I love it. I absolutely love it. But it's not a social gathering, but it's like I just feel, yeah. Yeah, so you could think of that as like, like this point of light that will just keep expanding and expanding and expand so far that it... It literally, as the light gets brighter and brighter, the darkness, the fears, the the thoughts of of the social aspects will just will not be able to uh, continue to seem to exist. The light just expands in our mind as we keep calling on the light, as we keep using the light over and over and over. It expands in our mind, and we become more and more identified with it. And that way, you know, you don't like Michael was saying, like. You know, he was looking for like quick fixes and he was into kind of helping people, believing he knew what true help was. And, oh, read this book. And here, I bought this for you. Did you read it? And all those kind of things. And then there's a humbleness, that humble pie, that that humbleness that comes from over and over just praying, I want to be truly helpful. So it does take persistence. You know, it's it's not like saying, you know, that... It, it will happen in an instant. It, it actually does for some, you know, you know, Eckhart Tolle and the park bench experience. That's a very rare experience when you go so deeply into a mystical experience that you suddenly feel completely disoriented from the world. I think Eckhart said it took, took some months, actually years, to start to stabilize from that mystical experience because it was so profound that to even be able to function in the world, it took a like an integrating time. There had to be an integration before the body could be used to to speak or to be used in a in a helpful way. And uh, so we're kind of giving it more in the the way that's more natural and normal in the sense that it's a it's it's highly individualized and it's usually a slowly evolving curriculum. Instead of just one, one wham bam mystical experience that just rocks your world and turns your upside down mind right side up in one, one instant, it can happen that way. It, it definitely can happen, but it's very, very unusual. And that's why you're at a mystery school, I think, to, to learn some of those, uh, those steps. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, you know, I'm so grateful to be here. And it's such a joy to be in a group where we're actually all speaking the same language <laughs> and um, on the same path. And um, I've been kind of struggling with sleeping, but last night I managed to sleep to one, which is the longest stretch I've had in a few days. And 
but uh, I'm not complaining, and I get up and and try to connect with with Jesus. And you know, it's so beautiful because a lot of what you've been saying is kind of what's being shown to me as well. And handing over some issues with family, which is what you're talking about, and and um, um, and so important to. Um, let go of the self-concept and feeling like you're being attacked. Um, and um, so I was doing that, and the same issue that you had, you know, I was also af- after the family, it was that one came up. And um, finally went back to bed about five, I think, and, um, um, you know, I'm feeling rested and and I don't have any issue with that today. It's the first day I'm feeling more present. Um, and I went quite deep into sleep, and I had the weirdest dream, and uh, kind of shook me when I woke up. And um, <clears throat> but it was on this. It just didn't make any sense to me. It was on this like seven forty seven, but we're on a mountain. And we're driving down this mountain road, and there's big switchbacks, you know, these big corners. And nobody seems to mind or even notice. And it's like, this isn't real. This is weird. You know, this is not normal. And um, and I'm kind of, you know, whoever is in the driver's seat doesn't seem to be. We're just going faster and faster. And I'm going, there's a corner up ahead. Slow down, you know. And... And uh, we just, um, it's just getting to be so fast and we're just, we finally couldn't make one of the corners and we're heading off and amazingly, like there's big boulders and things and it's like, we're going to crash, but somehow we don't. And then, um, and people in the airplane are starting to freak out and I'm concerned but not panicking like the, the 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 tremendous amount of fear that some of the others are. But I'm amazed that we're missing these obstacles. But it's like um, we then get to the cliff, and it's like they're turning on the engines to try and and fly it from just taking this leap. And that's when I woke up. And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> You're like, what the heck is that? And, um, but I realized after that was Holy Spirit driving and it was quite the ride, but I was very aware that this is a, this is, this is, um, it's like a dream, you know, it's a weird dream and, um, and yeah, so, um, I was wide awake after that. (laughs) So, I think I'm done. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's that's quite a a dream symbol of just of taking the leap. Yeah, that's. I think many of you are feeling that you've come here and and that there's something that is being offered, and you're just trying to be as open and receptive to that. But it's. It would be an unusual takeoff without a runway yes. <laughs> to to go to that point. But then there's this dreamlike quality, like, yeah, it's all it's all working out. Though we're not hitting any boulders and wings aren't getting ripped off, and it's not it's some amazing. di- disaster <laughs> scene. Amazingly, yeah. yeah, beautiful, beautiful, Eva Britt. Yes, I would like to take the opportunity to already now say, uh, because I feel that uh, what has come up here is also my feelings, and I can see how joined we are in this. I'm not alone in going through these feelings, but I just want to lift up, because to use this time the best that I can, that... uh, as I say, for me, like uh, 10 years <laughs> on this, like I, I have uh, like seen you <laughs> coming in 
uh, Mike and Mel and Jason and Kirsten. And of course, the first I met was you and Jenny at that time. And, and it was the gentleness and the light and the love. And I can't say I have any revelations in my own life, but I have this since I was a child. I felt such a love for Jesus. And when I was, I grew up in a church and I, I was like preaching when I was a child, a 10 year. And I, yeah, I was baptized, even if we hadn't that, it wasn't usual in that church, but at 15 I was baptized and I felt like this longing to be like this change, to be really rinsed and cleaned of. And I I know when I then did that at 15, I, I stood up from the water and I felt I wasn't changed. And the people in the church, they came and, greeted me as and the others and it was me and my elder sister I have uh, told her we must do this and we study the bible for it and, and you know it was that I was very ashamed that I didn't feel that I was quite another person and um, from that on I felt this uh, like change in me so I have been very lost in my grown-up days and searching and seeking and buying these self-help books when I was studying, came out in life and studied. And, and I even bought The Course in Miracles in '86, and I read 100 pages and I put it in the shelf and... I found a husband and a man that wanted me because I I felt like a real loser. I, I, I couldn't manage, I couldn't be any... I didn't know what to be, to become. I studied and I I got some jobs and I started and um, and there came a man that he really wanted me. He was like running after me and I ran. And he after, because he wanted me. And suddenly, after some time, I I surrendered. And uh, that is the man I'm living with. And we had a child. He's 30 yesterday. But it came to a point. But I, I feel that I have been like carried by something <laughs> even through this and uh, when I, it came to when I was 50 and I, I suddenly stood up and left my job I felt I can't be here I can't be doing this to myself because I've been like you know people pleasing extremely people pleasing and uh, it's the body started and my heart really started to with a lot of pain and panic attacks, and I, I just stood up and said, I must go. And it was a place where we worked, both my husband and I, and I went home and I sat on the floor and I prayed. I prayed. I don't want to go on like this. Please, please help me. And um, I felt this uh, that I was a loose because all these self-help books and all the books I had in my shelf, they were there, and I felt I must get rid of everything not that I don't want to throw them away because they have helped me in a way so I can give them to someone that needs them but I I don't I must do something and then I passed this course of miracle from 86 (laughs) and I looked it up and I just felt there was something there that spoke so to me so I just felt that love and it was another love. It was beyond the world. I felt loved. And from there on, I could sit reading this book because I had left my job and I were like having contact with the, the doctors. And, and I, I got some time to read. And uh, then I met a mighty companion in Värmland, Mira, that you have met. Uh, 
some time after, so I had a mountain companion, and then we went to this retreat in 2008. And that... Well, I, after I can think, I have seen something. Something was like lit up by that encounter. And for these years, I can say then 10 years what happened. I haven't left you. I have been with you at retreats and you came to Sweden. I came like every year. Almost I can say, there it is again. And Jenny came in and Helena and... Uh, but what I had, what what have I done? Because I feel like, you know, my fear has been to take the light and take it to the illusion. That's a big fear. And I think what maybe I have seen more and more or is that I have tried this in a way because I was so filled up with the love and I felt I can extend this love to others I have seen something and I can say come and see and I want to share that it's you David and uh, uh, causing miracles and I gave it to my sisters and <laughs> because it's a treasure and I know they maybe it's not for them but I must share the joy and so I did <laughs> and uh, but with my husband in my relation I felt now I can be here. Now I can love you the way, the, in truth. But he said that he wasn't interested. And he said that. And I said it again and again and again. And I have just not accepted it. And I have been like, I so want to give him that gift, you know, that I have got and my son and... But I feel I have felt so rejected by them and felt alone in, at home. And, and then I had needed you. I needed you, you know, the ego. I can see also how I have needed this to be the truth, to, to really convince me. And the fear that I'm tricked and the fear that I'm not loved and accepted by you. I'm nothing. I, I'm some... You can point at me and say, oh, that's one of those little, 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 <laughs> you know, the fear of, because I feel so little. I feel like a child and I, I know this littleness. I can see how I play out my littleness, but I can see that sometimes when I really feel little, I'm hiding. And when I play little, I'm not little. You know, this split in my mind, it has been like, and I can see how I have always felt gentle, gentle, be gentle with yourself and not put sugarcoat the mud cake. I don't want to sugarcoat the mud cake. And I, I can feel, that's why I said yesterday, you have done this for me because you have been like living demonstration uh, you, <laughs> that has also dared to take steps, that I can see that, and it's, we are guided, and I can just see, I must forgive myself for not being able to take that step for all these years, because I, I couldn't do it, and I must accept, this is how it looks, it, this is what is, and I try to, to trust that if if God wanted me to really do it, I, I c could do it. I had done it. Because like now when I'm here, what brought me here? That power, it's not of my littleness. It's something like just, I must go. It's the journey of my life. That came to me. And that came to my husband. <laughs> he heard me. And he said, yeah, if you have to do it, do it. He hadn't said, no, I don't allow you to go to retreats. I don't, because you have been there all the time. And now I can see I'm provided for it. I'm being taken care of by him. In a way, I can just feel how the beauty, what a gift that he has been there. And he has actually supported me. He has been the one behind. I know when I drove you sometime in Sweden, I said, this, I have no money for a car. This is my husband's, for my husband's job. We can have this car that I can drive you when you come. 
And you said, good that you see that. <laughs> and it was like, you know, I hadn't seen it before. But I can just see we are provided, and I trust it more and more and more. Thank you. Thank you, you, Eva Britt, for sharing that because it's like it it takes a lot of faith in this journey. And and we've just recently watched this movie of this man called Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, and and even through his whole life of his gentleness and giving and radiating, working with children, you know, he had some doubt thoughts that came later on in his life when the 9-11, when the towers came down. He just thought, oh, what have I, what what have I really even offered? There's so much darkness and so much evil that he was even faced with those doubt thoughts. And then before he passed away, um, he kept reading the Bible, and reading these passages in the Bible, and this one thing was uh, was the the key issue at the very end of his life. He's like, uh, am I? Am I a sheep or a goat? <laughs> you know, and his wife just smiled and said, Surely, Fred, if anyone was a sheep, you are a sheep. <laughs> but there's this doubt, this unworthiness, this self doubt that even with the course can sometimes wonder, I think I've I've done it. There's just there's there is a greater self in me that that's propelling me, that brought me here to the mystery school that is leading me, that's guiding me. And we just have to just realize that that's the truth. That's the truth of it. The rest has just been doubt thoughts of our identity, just just trying to still hold on, have some place of our mind that gives them a slight belief. But those are the reinterpretations when you, first of all, a lesson is that that through divine providence, everything that's happened in your life, you've been cared for. You've been taken care of and you've been cared for. And then when the thoughts can come up, like of the of the pain of, of your husband not being interested in, in, in participating or receiving this love that you have become aware of, that you want to extend, it reminds me of an early lesson I had too where it's like we we have to trust the Spirit, we have to trust the Holy Spirit and Jesus to tell us where to bestow our miracles. That we cannot, miracles cannot be bestowed indiscriminately. That there's a, there's a precision even to the ones that we're, we're to offer something to. We have to become so aligned. We can't say to the Spirit, but but my husband, this is my husband. And this is my son. Don't you realize who these people are and how important they are in my life? And and the Spirit's like, please trust me. There's a bigger plan. I know where the, the miracles can be received. I know where you can sow your seeds and they will take fruit. And I must guide you and direct you. And I always share that happened in my life when I was going to those course groups and I was having so many miracles every week and I would go back to my parents and and sit down in their living room and try to, almost bursting with miracles, like, no, no, you you, you have to understand, this is what this is important, this is God, this is really what's happening. And, and it didn't take long till my mother said, I already have a minister. Like, and then at some point she said, uh, you need to find other people to share this with. And I was aware that that was Jesus speaking through my mom, telling me, almost forecasting me how things would go. And so you have been aware of that with your, with your sisters. You know, you just have to stay open to that, Lord, here I am, Lord. Where would you have me bestow your miracles? you in charge be you in charge i would but follow because that's the pain is when we try to direct the miracle it would be like trying to direct water coming down a mountain and saying don't go to that rock whatever you do go over there but avoid that boulder (laughs) over there we can't direct the water that flows down and we and also we can't direct the miracles it's very humbling you know 
because I was quiet and shy and and didn't like to travel and didn't like to speak. And Jesus, you know, the Holy Spirit was like, ah, we can work with that. But there will be some traveling <laughs> and some speaking involved. But just don't think that you have to do it personally, individually. You know, I will do it through you if you just give me the trust. So that's that's what's brought you here. You, through all of that, you've you've made it to yes. come to this point. And I must just tell, because it's a miracle that... You know, when I came from the first retreat and I had bought also this CD uh, collection and I met my sister on my way home and she said, well, uh, they wanted her and my mother to tell me what I, what I had been with. And I tried to express it and I took these CDs and said, you listen for yourself, take this, you can take this. And it... You know, that started something in her. So today, and she has been with me also in Mallorca in 2010 and in Spain. And now today, we three sisters are sharing and reading a course. I have my mighty companions in my sisters. And, uh, you know, we know this is an advanced teaching with your biological family and your sister, you know, <laughs> to work three of us. But it's so beautiful, and so, oh, it's a miracle. <laughs> okay. I think Emily has come, yep, just about that time, 1029. So you have a little bit of a break before the functions start, but Emily can give, you, give us all an update with everything. Thank you.